Our next speaker is Marcello, and he'll be telling us about integration, uh, integrated motion planning. Hi. So the, this work has been done in cooperation with my colleagues at Orebru University in Sweden and with uh, Sven Koenig and Tan Zaluras at uh, the University of Southern California. This is really lar part of a larger project that we had running for three years now, and now it's over and a successor has been started, or will start in September, that is about coordination of fleet of autonomous vehicles. So we have a bunch of partners, industrial partners, that have very uh, different application scenarios, but well, maybe not so difficult needs, the different needs. We have a partner that does these huge machines that are like 40 tons that go into mines and they have to scoop ore and dump it in a pit. And they want to automatize this, pro this, uh, this procedure. In part, it's already done because they have fixed paths in long corridors underground. So they can, the operator just have to pitch in whenever there is more skillful maneuvering needed, but it, they do not have any kind of uh, uh, fleet automation or more complex movements. And then we have a construction partner. This machine is still quite large, 19 tons, but the, the setting is totally different because we are in the open air and we have gravel piles that this machine has to scoop up uh, and then uh, drop the bucket full into a bin to prepare asphalt, and the asphalt has different recipes of different gravels. And then finally, we have a, an, another partner. We have others, but these are the three principal at the moment, uh, where they have smaller machines with some kind of gripper in, inside environments. They have forklifts or this simple uh, gripper to take paper reels and to move from one place to the other of the warehouse. So these application domains are very, very different, but we could elicit some common, uh, common problem underneath them all. So they need to transport goods by one place, uh, from one place to the next, and this must be done by one or more vehicles. And all these problems have uh, constraints on time and resources. So we want the warehouse to be sorted in a specific time, or we want the asphalt production to go at a specific rate. But also the environment, although very different, still presents some kind of similarities. First of all, there is the presence of uncontrolled objects uh, that are humans or other vehicles. And this is something that our partners are adamant. They do not want to get rid of other vehicles or the humans in the loop. Uh, the, the environment changes over time. Uh, so the, 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 the wheel loader will find that the, the pile has changed because, well, it has been modified by itself or by other wheel loaders, or we will find that the paper reel is not exactly where we expected. And this brings to the third point in which they all uh, are similar. The whereabouts of the objects to transport as is only known online. It cannot be known precisely beforehand. But there is also a third aspect on which all these three application scenarios are very similar. So the vehicles that we have to deal with are generally non-autonomic and definitely not trivial. So we have to be sure that they will not collide with objects, uh, that they will be uh, precise enough to reach the position that they have to pick up, and most certainly that they do not collide with anything because a 19 ton like that is not like a lab robot that just gives you a bruise. So what is the current practice in fleet automation? Uh, mostly fixed paths and traffic rules. And fixed paths and traffic rules are very expensive, costly, and unflexible um, procedures because there is an expert that decides the paths with a tool. And then these, uh, these paths have to be um, uh, run always in the same way. If there is a change in the environment, then new paths have to be done. And the same goes with traffic rules. Besides, traffic rules um, are very difficult to specify and very difficult to verify. So if there is a problem in the end, we will know only when the deck log will occur and the warehouse is completely blocked. And that's something that we really don't want to know at that time. And then it's very hard to guarantee overall mission requirements. So with traffic rules, it's difficult to say we want the production finish or all the goods moved by this time because if a vehicle has to yield to another vehicle that breaks down or whatever, then these requirements will not be met. So the aim of the project that I'm talking about is to develop general methods for fleet automation that can be applied to different industrial domains. And with this aim 
in, in mind, we decompose the fleet automation problem into six modules. Those six modules should not be seen as a sequence because it's true that perception is the first part in which we actually see where we can drive, but it's also true that then we need it at execution time to know if there, we are bumping into a person or uh, to identify exactly where is the spot where we have to pick up the pallet. So we have perception, then we have task allocations, which vehicle should do what, uh, then motion planning to avoid to have prefixed paths, overall coordination, because as we said, traffic rules is something that we would like to avoid. And finally, execution monitoring and low level control. Although, yeah, low level control, you shouldn't say that to someone that studies control theory. In this uh, specific talk, we are gonna fix on motion planning, coordination, and execution monitoring, and the interaction of those three modules. But on a global perspective, how do we make all these modules communicate? Well, we, it came out that basically a fleet coordination is um, coordinating trajectories in the end. So it all boils down to know where a vehicle will be at a specific time. So we have a common representation that is trajectory, we call trajectory envelopes, that are like groups of trajectories that are feasible and acceptable. And there are, and all the, modules around this picture constrain us the, 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 well, in a way that we'll see. Let's make an, a simple example. So we have a mine and we have to deliver some goods in this mine in the tunnels. So we take a least commitment approach. At the beginning, all solutions are possible. Then we have the task allocations that excludes other locations as destinations. And then we have motion planning that enforces kinematically constra kinematic constraints and therefore removes kinematically unfeasible trajectories. In this case, probably we'll say you cannot take a specific tunnel because it's too tight for you or you cannot turn that, that that's closed turn. And then we have uh, the coordination that prunes away all the temporal trajectories, so the temporal profiles that will lead to collisions among vehicles. The important point is that we have a least commitment approach, which means that we spe choose specific trajectories only at execution time. However, we have to keep checking if these trajectories are still valid against unforeseen contingencies and eventually change them if needed. So, what is a trajectory? A, tra a trajectory is a path with attached a temporal profile, but we do not want to consider only a single path. We want to consider rather um, a space constraint on, in which the vehicle should move. So in this case, it's not anymore a trajectory, but it's a trajectory envelope in the sense that it contains several, several spatially different trajectories. And with the same principle, we can also um, adapt the time. So instead of having fixed times over space, we have time intervals over space. But how do we come up with that? Well, let's say that we have this, uh, this map and um, the, oh, I have a pointer call. Uh, these parts in blue are actually the destinations of the vehicles. So the first part is the, uh, the motion planner. We have a lattice-based motion planner, uh, which has a bunch of very desirable properties in my views. Uh, I am the author of the motion planner, by the way. So, I mean, we can do a lot of stuff very fast. And we, um, calculate, the, we calculate these kinematically feasible uh, motions within the map. And this is our first input. But then, since we do not want to stick to specific paths, we sample those paths and we create polyhedra over them that overlap in a way to have spatial envelopes of trajectories. So the vehicle should move really within those constraints. I mean, the way we build this polyhedra is a little bit better explained in the paper. It's not that simple, but the, pr the, the principle behind it is quite simple. And once we have this polyhedra, we actually can uh, run, simulate a run of the vehicles over these paths and um, st have a first approximation of the temporal, um, temporal profile by saying if I drive at minimum speed, at maximum speed, when do I, would I enter and exit each polygon? And this is the first approximation, but then we have the second part of when we uh, further restrain, we uh, further, further constrain this approach, uh, this um, temporal, uh, this trajectory envelope, 
by means of central coordination. So we identify all the polyhedra that overlap both in time and space because they represent those places where we could have a conflict, that is, a collision. And we use a CSP search for conflict-resolving temporal constraints. Here, the variables are pairs of spatial temporal overlapping polyhedra, while the values are temporal constraints that eliminate temporal overlap. And this is quite simple intuitively. I mean, if we have a, a polyhedra, that, uh, two polygons that overlap in space and time, then we have to enforce that one of the vehicles would pass first. So there are only two ways to resolve it for each conflict. However, we, we discovered that that's, it's not as easy as it seems, because at this point, we arrive at a point in which if we follow the, the, these procedures sequentially, then we will arrive at a point in which uh, we only can resolve conflicts temporally. So only the central coordination can allocate a, a, a temporal interval for the vehicles. But this is not always possible, because if we have something like this, so if the, all the polyhedra of two different vehicles completely overlap because the two vehicles have to switch places, then we cannot resolve this temporally because they will eventually collide for sure. And therefore, uh, there, is, there must be a tighter cooperation between motion planning and coordination. How do we do that? Well, we plan jointly for the vehicles whenever this kind of problem arises. We do not always plan a motion plan for all the vehicles together, but we only restrain our calculations to the vehicles that have these kind of problems, and they can be detected by the coordinator. And uh, this is mostly because planning for multiple vehicles at the same time is exceedingly expensive. So we extended the framework of lattice-based motion planning to multi-robot motion planning. And uh, the output of the planner is motions that can actually be coordinated. As an example, these are two forklifts in our simulation, and um, they have to swap places. If the motions were calculated independently, they would just crash against each other. But using the joint motion planner, we calculate motions that allow one of the vehicles to get out of the way. So we do not attach a motion planning uh, time yet a temporal profile, but we guarantee that these uh, motions that are generated will be schedulable. So the coordinator will find a temporally feasible solution. And in this case, it does because one of the vehicles first moves forward and then moves backwards uh, towards its position. It's a little bit slow, so trust me, it ends well. So there is also a second loop that is quite important, and it's between the coordinator and the vehicle executive. Uh, the vehicle executive is the one that keeps track of what is really going on at the vehicle level. So let's say that these two, in this example, let's explain as an example. In this example, vehicle one has to yield to vehicle two. This is uh, because coordination has decided that in the intersection of the polyhedra, vehicle two has to pass first. But then something bad happens to vehicle two. It can happen, a flat tire or a heavy load, it slows down. At this point, vehicle one, it still has the enforced thing that he has to yield to vehicle two. And this time will be propagated by the coordinator. How far will it be propagated? Well, until vehicle one maybe has to reach, reach a deadline. And in this case, uh, it is important to have feedback from the vehicle executive because the coordinator may decide to reschedule to meet the deadline uh, required by vehicle one. So basically, we have a continuous loop of coordination online. Motion planning is only invoked whenever necessary, but coordination has to run in the background to ensure that all the deadlines will be met. So our system uh, turned out that has former properties that we were not really expecting at the beginning and that really surprised and pleased our industrial partners because they were very happy to be, uh, to be able to prove correctness and completeness. That means that under some operational assumptions, we can, we can safely, I mean, we can prove that uh, if motion planning and coordination uh, succeed, the resulting trajectory envelopes contain at least one trajectory that is kinematically feasible, conflict and deadlock free, which means that whenever, whatever comes out of our system will be executable. 
And we will know in advance if it is not executable. I mean, if a deadline will not be um, met, then we will know it beforehand. If there is a risk of a deadlock, we will know that beforehand. We do not have to make the warehouse a mess. And also completeness. So under these operational assumptions that are more specifically in the paper, then if a set of kinematically feasible conflict and deadlock-free trajectories exists, then the motion planner and the coordinator will yield a non-empty set of trajectory envelopes. If there is a solution, we will find it. So, and this is to conclude, maybe slightly in advance, incredibly. Uh, this, uh, we also implemented and de deployed that in a longer demonstration. This is just an extra, um, small part. In this case, is exactly what I showed. There is a vehicle that has to yield to the other, but then a software obstacle has been added. And this one keeps yielding to the other until this passes by, because there is no deadline. But in this case, there is no conflict. Uh, the backward and forward motion that you have noticed is just because of the controller. It's not something that we decided. Uh, and then there is the switch places. In this case, is exactly this, this a similar case that I showed you. Um, the two trajectories would have conflicted spatially. So in this case, the multi-robot motion planner was used to calculate conflict, I mean, schedulable trajectories that then the coordinator are located in time to reach the final destination. And I think, yes. To conclude, uh, we have developed a fleet management system with provable properties. We have defined a common representation, the trajectory envelopes, for different solvers. We have implemented and demonstrated all the components on industrial vehicle, well, all the ones that I talked here, because the, the task allocation is still done in a fairly simple way. Uh, as part of the future work, we would like to integrate new solvers into the sisters, uh, system, so a more complex task allocation, for instance. And we would also explore tighter coupling of motion planning and coordination, because this works. Uh, it's uh, on demand, so to speak. But maybe if we could do something more tighter, it would be easier and more flexible. And that is it. Now I'm done. So we have plenty of time for questions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the, your correctness results that uh, there, there exists one among the trajectories that you generated that, that uh, is correct in yes. this sense. So how do you guarantee that uh, this will be the trajectory actually taken by the system in the distributed case? Do you mean at execution time? Yes. Oh, we can't. I mean, we can only monitor that the vehicles are executing the correct one. So we dispatched a trajectory that How is would you know the correct one? You know that uh, there, is ex there exists one that is correct, but uh, uh, how would you characterize it beforehand, in particular in the distributed case? About the CSP questions, like the temporal coordination, I would address Federico before I say something stupid. Uh, the, the trajectories are extracted, uh, so specific trajectories are extracted with an earliest time approach. So basically, we have a, an STN underneath all of this, as you can imagine. Okay. We extract the earliest time trajectories. These are guaranteed to adhere to all uh, the temporal constraints that have been uh, added. Yep. And in addition, our controllers are guaranteed, the vehicle controllers are guaranteed to uphold uh, the uh, bounds, uh, the, the choice of specific allocation of time to time points, uh, as well as uh, to stay within the polyhedra that have been decided by the motion planner. So in the end, that's, of course, that's our best effort. If the controller breaks down, I mean, an unforeseen, we cannot, we cannot uh, guarantee it. No, but unforeseen contingency would be noted and uh, replan. I mean, we would know in advance if something is going wrong. Um, so you, you showed an example with, with two vehicles with overlapping motions. How far up can you re reliably sort of scale that sort of thing, like 10, 20? With the motion planner, not that much right now. I mean, uh, the, uh, we tried at the, up to three vehicles, and we never scaled up too much because, in general, all the, in the, all the tests, like the groups of conflicting vehicles were two or three. 
Uh, then we developed this idea a little bit further and it's going to be presented at IROS this year. It works well with two or three vehicles. With more than that, it starts to get a little bit crowded because, I mean, the number of motion primitives to capture the kinematic constraints here are huge. So yeah. we are talking a branching factor of 70 for a simple vehicle. All right. Thank you. Thanks. All right, well, let's thank the speaker. And the uh, 